uh, Gary isn't here right in our midst this morning, but I just want to thank him for that sermon last uh, Sunday on winning, um, winning the race. And I, um, I was especially spellbound by the story that he told about his brother on the railroad tracks running for his life as that train was barreling down on top of them. Now, Kevin had no idea what I was going to do this Sunday. Sometimes I have no idea what I'm going to get to on a given Sunday. But anyways, he inadvertently kind of set the table for me this morning as he spoke about perseverance, the perseverance that's required for the long, hard, serious race that is set before us, a race that requires some laying aside, laying aside of the weight and the sins that can so easily entangle us, a race that must be run like the examples of faith before us, but also must be run as examples of faith for those who are watching on. And of course, a race that may require a cross, as it did for Jesus. So this morning, I'm going to pick up on Kevin's theme of perseverance. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And spend some time there. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we need this. I need this word this morning, that's for sure. And many of us probably do. Many of us are weary and tired and exhausted, physically, emotionally, socially, maybe even spiritually depleted. And we need to be refreshed by this encouragement, this exhortation that we're going to read from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. So, Holy Spirit, speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. All right, so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read a couple of verses from first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy... We do not lose heart. Verse 5. For we do not preach preach ourselves, but rather we preach Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. I trust that's true for you, that he has caused that light to shine in your heart. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. For nine years, when I was teaching at uh, Peace River Bible Institute, I trained and traveled with a little drama team. Every year, we were in 40 different churches, 40 different beds, and we probably had 40 different types of of, uh, lasagna. (laughs) But we always had peach juice, and to this day, I have a hard time eating drinking peach juice. But our drama team was called Earthen Vessels from this verse. God puts within us a treasure into earthen vessels. Vessels, literally cracked pots, or in my case, a crack pot. Wow, that God would do that. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God. This is why it's in earthen vessels. So the excellency of of the power could be seen of God, not of us. Verse number eight. Listen to these verses eight and nine. We are hard pressed. On every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but we're never forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. I wonder what shape you're in this morning as you came into our this place of worship. Have you come here this morning feeling hard-pressed on every side? 
Maybe there's friction in your marriage, trouble with the kids, tension with your in-laws or your outlaws. Maybe you're hard-pressed by mounting bills to pay expensive car or house repairs to be made. You're hard-pressed because you got some dental work ahead of you that's going to cost you a fortune. Maybe you're hard-pressed because you're struggling to make the decisions about what I'm going to do with daycare with my kids and schooling options with my kids this year and another day in another year of the pandemic. Maybe you're feeling hard-pressed because you have another day of chronic pain to be faced. Maybe you're hard-pressed because of some toxicity in your workplace or maybe job insecurity. Hard-pressed on every side. Is that where you're at? Maybe you're here this morning because you're feeling perplexed, right? You're perplexed about COVID-19. Come on. There is so much stuff out there. What do you believe? What do you toss out? What do you take in? It's perplexing. You're perplexed about the pending federal election and listening to all these leaders and wondering, how in the world is this country going to get itself back together? Maybe you're perplexed about why you're still suffering. Maybe you're perplexed about where is God and what is he doing? Maybe you're perplexed with the question, will things ever let up? What does the future hold? Maybe you're perplexed. On the other hand, maybe you've come here this morning feeling persecuted, bullied, picked on, singled out for mistreatment, harassed. Or maybe you're here this morning because you're feeling a little bit struck down, put down, beaten down, your ideas dismissed, your contributions at home or at work have gone unnoticed, unacknowledged, and unrewarded. And you're feeling struck down. Maybe you're here this morning because you're just tuckered out. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're running on empty. You're ready to give it up. You're ready to give in. You're ready to throw in the towel. You're ready to surrender defeat. You're ready to pack it in. You're ready to quit. Now, if you're like that, you're not alone. You know, all the years of ministry that Bernina and I have been in, I don't know if I've ever felt closer to quitting. Now, I got to tell you, Satan has not quite defeated me, but he has certainly deflated me. And maybe you. And I need this exhortation from Paul this morning to not lose heart. And my guess is that you might need it as well. That I'm not alone in this. You know, folks, we're about to begin another season of ministry here at our church, Innisfail Baptist Church, still facing COVID-19 craziness. We're going to need some floor hockey helpers. We're going to need some Bible teachers and facilitators. We're going to need some kids club and youth group volunteers. We're going to need some board members, some elders, some song leaders. We're going to need our pianists. We're going to need vocalists. We need our bookkeepers. We need technicians. We need kitchen workers. We need nursery workers. We need Timothy Town volunteers. But if any of us here this morning have lost heart, if any of us have given up, if we've thrown in the towel and we're feeling hard-pressed on every side because we're perplexed, because we're persecuted, or maybe we're feeling struck down, we're not going to be able to pull off another year of ministry. We're going to fail our Lord and we're going to fail our community. Paul said, therefore, we do not lose heart. Don't you have wonder? How is that even possible? How is that even possible not to lose heart? How did Paul not lose heart when, as he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you want to flip there, you can. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians verse 23, 
I am in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I've been shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, the Jews, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils at sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, toil, sleeplessness, often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and in nakedness. And besides all these other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. And you thought COVID-19 was hard to live with. <laughs> you know, Paul had lots of reasons to lose heart, didn't he? But he refused to quit. He even refused to think about quitting. Astounding. If you want to flip back to chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he starts off the same way. Therefore, do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I want to point out some good reasons not to lose heart for myself this morning and maybe for you. And they're all found in these verses. So here's the first one. First reason for not to lose heart, stated in verse number 16, therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing. Now, that kind of sounds strange on the surface. You would think that would be the very thing that would cause us to lose heart. Now, this, truth, this is true, by the way, both practically speaking and meta metaphorically speaking, this idea that the other man is perishing. It's true practically speaking. That is to say, our outward, physical, material, human body is perishing. It's like a sun-scorched, dried-up, deteriorating canvas tent. It's waning, and it's worn out. It is aging, and it is ailing. Outward, we are falling apart, and we're tired. Our health is deteriorating day by day. Our energy levels are depleting. For some of us, we have fewer days ahead of us than what we had behind us. Physically speaking, there's some truth to this. Our outward man is perishing. Now, while that sounds like really bad news, the kind of news that might make you lose heart because of the deterioration of your physical man, it's also good news. It's also good news. Coralie reminded me of it this morning. Because it means that eternity with Jesus is closer today than it was yesterday. It's good news that our outward man is perishing because it means we're getting ready for something else. Our outward man is perishing, practically speaking, but it's not just our bodies that are perishing. 
It's more than that. The outward man is perishing metamor uh, metaphorically. That is to say, the outward, physical, tangible world that we live in, what we see around us, the scene as we know it, is also perishing. It's passing away. This world system is on its way out. It's falling apart at the seams, and we see it all around us. And we start to panic because what chaos have we got in our country right now? It's all perishing. It's fragile. It's fleeting. And it means that life is a daily challenge. And if you imagine for even a moment that you're going to get to a place where you're going to be on cruise control, you're sadly mistaken. You know, we, we, you know, so much of our life I'm thinking, oh, it's great, finally going to get to retirement. And, you know, we'll be able just to kind of cruise along after that. Well, I don't have much to retire on. I don't know for you guys. And you know what? Once you get there, it, ask anybody that's retired in our audience, the aging and the ailing, and they'll tell you, you know, <laughs> growing old is not easy. Paul rightly said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, I die daily. Death is nearby every day. Life and survival is a daily challenge here on this earth. It's like so many other things. If you want to get fit, if you want to get fit, it's an everyday challenge. You can't just, you know, do your 20 push-ups on one day and then skip 90 and do another 20 and skip, you know, another two months. You know, if you want to get fit, you have to do it every single day. If you want marital harmony in your home, it's a daily challenge. It never stops. It's relentless. You can't say, I love you, just at, you know, when you walk down that aisle and say, oh, well, I said it 37 years ago, 47 years ago. I haven't changed my mind, so why are you asking? <laughs> it's a daily challenge, isn't it? There may be some brief moments of respite in this world, but there are more troubles on the way. God and God's word never said it would be easy. As the hymn says, this world is not my own. I'm just a passing through. And here we have this thought again. The bad news is that as long as we are in this world, we will face trouble. But there's reason for hope because there's a better world to come, folks. There's a better world to come, so don't lose heart, Paul says. Paul gives us a second reason not to lose heart in the next verse. It says this, For even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The good news for a follower of Jesus Christ is that we are not defined by our physical limitations. We are not limited by death, by dying, or by decay. We can be renewed day by day, every day. We may be in a decaying world, but we are not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. John put it this way in 1 John chapter 2. You'll recognize these verses. Do not love the world, nor the things of the, nor the, things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, we all have these problems, the pride and the arrogance of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And listen to verse 17. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. Yeah. The outward man is perishing. But the inward man can be renewed. 
day by day. This renewal, of course, needs to happen day by day, daily. Once a week on Sundays is not going to be enough for you. You're going to have to do some work on your own every day to get into God's Word, to read it, to, to pray, to think on it, to chew on it, to meditate on it, to let God talk to you and to speak to Him. You will always be on the edge of spiritual and emotional exhaustion if you're not renewed daily. And of course, the Bible gives us all kinds of little hints about this daily renewal pro process. It talks about renewing the mind. Remember that passage in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8? Whatever things are lovely, beautiful, peaceful, think on these things. Renew your mind. Get your mind into God's word instead of all in the bad news. Renew your mind and do it every day or you're not going to make it. Renew your spirit. In Psalms, the psalmist said, 46 verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. You need to pull away sometimes and spend some time to connect with God and renew your spirit. And of course, you need to renew your heart. And the best place to do that, believe it or not, is right here in this fellowship with the fellowship of the believers. And that's why Hebrews says, don't neglect the fellowship of the saints. You need to renew your, your heart. You need that encouragement. You need it often. The outward man is perishing, but don't lose heart because the inward man is being renewed daily. And then verse number 17 provides a third reason not to lose heart. And here it is. For our light affliction is but for a moment. Verse 18 says, For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now remember who is writing these words. The guy that has been beaten. The guy that has been stoned almost to death. The guy that's been shipwrecked and everything else. He's calling these events light affliction that only lasts for a moment. Oh, I wish I could get there and have that perspective that what is happening to me right now is light in compared to God's glory, it is short, not lasting compared to eternity. We tend to think that our problems in our life are weighty, they're heavy, they're way too much to bear. And we tend to think that the good days are going to be few and far between and very fleeting. But God's word declares the very opposite. It says our problems are light in comparison to the weight of God's glory. What, whatever, whatever you are dealing with today is nothing compared to what lies ahead in eternity, what awaits you. So don't lose heart. This life, as harsh it is, is but for a moment. This too will pass. It will all pass away. Trouble will one day fade into the past, and we will all, we will have all of eternity to bask in the warmth of Jesus and the glory of God. Don't lose heart, folks. Don't lose heart. It's been a long year and a half. But don't lose heart. The outward man is perishing. The inner man can be renewed. Don't lose heart. Your afflictions are light and not lasting, if you can get your head around that. And finally, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Because our afflictions are working for us and not against us. Wow. What a crazy verse. For our light affliction, verse 17, which is but for a moment, is working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That is just mind-boggling. That our afflictions are working for us, not against us. Troubles and difficulties 
are not your enemies. They're your friends. Our afflictions are at work in us for our own good and for God's glory. That's what God's word says. Hard stuff is not happening to you. It's happening for you, for our benefit. Here's how Paul put it in Philippians. This is chapter 1, verses 12 and on. Philippians 1, 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, and what's he talking about? What has happened to me? Well, he got captured by the Romans. He got handcuffed, and he got dragged out to prison. This is what's happened to me, this hard stuff. These afflictions have happened to me. And I want you to know that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident in my chains, and much more bold to speak the word without fear. You know, maybe the day will come when I'm going to do something that is so, so much against the authorities of our countries that maybe some of us are going to be handcuffed and dragged off to prison. Are we going to be like this? Are we going to say, hey, this is a good thing, not a bad thing? <laughs> This is going to result in the gospel. You know, Paul ends up right at the very center of Rome in one of the most critical prisons on the planet where he has influence on all of Rome because of his testimony while he is in prison. Incredible. Our hardships, our afflictions, are not working against us. They're working for us. Remember what Joseph said way back in Genesis chapter 50 after all the hardship that he suffered under the hands of his brothers? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is to this day to save many people alive. Joseph ends up at the pinnacle at the top of the heap in a place where he can distribute food and save the lives of thousands of people. Craziness. Our affliction isn't working against us. It's working for us. And here, of course, is Romans. And we know these verses, right? Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And then down to verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Verse number 28. And we know. Do you know this? Do you believe this? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We've got the verse down. We've memorized it. Do we believe it? Verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You know, God will not spare any opportunity, any kind of affliction, any event. He will use it all to conform us to the image of his Son, if we will let him. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, here's the great news. These he also glorified. Verse 31 says, what then? 
What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, finish the sentence, who can be against us? Don't lose heart. If God is for us, who can be against us? Don't lose heart, for though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is renewed daily. Don't lose heart. For your afflictions, your troubles, your difficulties are light and they're not lasting. Don't lose heart. For your troubles, difficulties, afflictions are working for you, not against you. So folks, we're about to enter another year of ministry here. We're not going to make it if we've all lost heart. We need these verses. We need to grab hold of them, believe them to be true, operate in the truth of them, gird ourselves up, get up again, like Paul did off of that heap of the dump when he was left and stoned almost to death. He gets up, walks 20 miles back to Derby, preaching the gospel again. Don't lose heart. Father, we thank you for this word from your word and how much we need it. We're all kind of exhausted, I think, tired mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. We're drained. We're running on empty, many of us. And Father, we need these verses. We need you to, by your Holy Spirit, to change our, our perspective a little bit, to remind us that, yeah, it's all perishing here, but better days are to come. So help us to help us to forge our way ahead, even in hardship. Lord, we thank you, God, that you don't waste even the hard things in our life, but you can use them for our good and for your glory. So God, give us the ability to embrace our afflictions and our hardships. And Father, help us to cooperate with you in letting them mold us and shape us into the image of your Son. And this year, Father, we, there's all kinds of things we would love to do in our community for your glory and for the good of our community. But, Lord, we can't pull it off if we are all perishing and if we've lost heart. So strengthen us. Breathe the fresh air into us, each one of us into marriages that are maybe in trouble, into folks that are suffering and hurting with ongoing physical battles. Breathe a little bit of respite and hope and recovery and cause us to mount up with wings as eagles, to run and not to be weary, to walk and not faint.